Hello, it's Pastor Mark here, and I want to welcome you to East Brady Baptist Church's worship stream for Sunday, May 17th, 2020. Whether you're joining us as this video goes live on Facebook or at a later date, or maybe you're watching via our webpage at www.eastbradybaptist.com or on our YouTube channel, we are glad that you are here, and we trust that God will bless you as we spend this time together here today. I want to ask you to please do us a favor and leave a comment on Facebook so that we can know that you joined us. And I also would like to ask you to consider sharing this video or using it to start a watch party on your Facebook page. I mean, just click share. Sharing your church experience this week is as easy as that. That said, we turn now to our call to worship, which this week is taken from Psalm 62. My soul rests in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning first to give you worship and praise. You are the King. You are the Lord. You are the one who did indeed create us and give us life. You never leave us. You always reach out your hand to us. For these things we praise you. We come because we need to confess our sins to you, Lord, to open the hidden places of our hearts before you. We confess that we forget that you love us more than anything and that you call us to follow you alone. We arrange our lives around idols of this world and not around you. We want what others have or what they tell us to want. We are afraid of rejection by the world, forgetting that you are the only one we need to serve. We look for love in ways that will never bring us peace and lasting joy, Lord. For this we are sorry. Please forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, for our announcements today, just, just two brief things. Number one, the mission we are collecting for this month and praying for this month is Camp Judson, our summer camp up along Lake Erie. Now, I do want to announce to you that Camp Judson announced just last Friday that due to the coronavirus pandemic, they will be unable to operate summer camps this year. So this for sure is going to put a financial strain on Camp Judson. So please give what you can when, when you're writing out uh, your, your offering checks to the church. Please, if you can, put a little extra in there for Camp Judson and mark that on, on your envelope. And continue to pray for Camp Judson that their ministry can continue to go forward even though students can't be physically on the campsite this summer. The only other announcement I have is that church council will meet again online this Wednesday at 7 p.m. So church council members, I want to ask you to watch your Facebook messages for meeting information for that. We will once again be discussing when and how to reopen in-person events at our church building now that uh, Clarion, Armstrong, and Butler counties are in the yellow phase. Yay! And all of you who are out there who are not on church council, be sh sure to know that we will keep you updated about what our plans are, when we tend to reopen, and what we're going to do going forward. We'll let you know when things change. In the meantime, I want to ask you to keep checking in on each other and keep taking care of each other. If you uh, know someone in this congregation you haven't heard from or you haven't contacted since we stopped in-person services, well, now is the time to reach out. Make a call, send a message, send an email, send a note, send a card, send something. Just reach out and love each other. So now we head into our prayer time, and I want to remind you that if you have a prayer request that you would like to be included in this stream uh, for me to pray while we're having the stream, I want to ask you to send it to me before Thursday afternoon each week because, the, uh, you know, that's when we have to record things in order to get everything ready for Sunday morning. So send it to me by then, or if you have a prayer request now, please feel free to type it into comments uh, during this stream on Facebook. I will be sure to check those comments and be praying for you throughout the week, and I encourage all of you to do likewise for each other. That said, let us pray. Oh dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for loving us. God, as your word tells us, while we were still sinners, while we didn't care at all about you or anything about you, you loved us and sent your Son Jesus to die for us. So we thank you for that. We thank you, Heavenly Father, 
for saving us, for saving our souls for all eternity through your son, Jesus Christ. So we thank you that you are a God who calls us to, to be with you, to spend time with you, to experience your goodness and your greatness. And, and, and God, we thank you for allowing us to live in that. We thank you as, as spring fights its way into existence here this year, Father. We have the cold days, we have the warm days, but we have lots of rain. We sometimes have sunshine. We thank you for giving it all to us, God, and for replenishing your earth and just giving us the sunshine to to improve our moods father and allowing us to be outside since we can't be interacting as much inside as usual god we're, we thank you for this season where we can get outdoors and and stretch our legs a little bit god we thank you for all the things you you do for us and the blessings you bestow upon us each day god the many things where we are all fed we we have homes we have dry homes and and we are cared for god so we do thank you for that we thank you for giving us the fellowship of east brady baptist church uh, where we can come with other like-minded people to experience your love and your joy, and where we can come to worship you and magnify you to the world and glorify you and all that we do, Father. Where we can have this, this feeling uh, uh, of Christian, of faith family among us, God. So we thank you for that. We thank you that we live in a nation where, where we can come together as believers, even if it's just online, God, but we can come together in our faith and declare our faith in your son, Jesus Christ, and worship you from the privacy of our own homes in such a public way, God. How great that is. We thank you for the technology to meet this way. But God, will we turn our attention to things in our lives that... Uh, uh, well, maybe we're struggling with, or maybe we're struggling to understand, or we know people who are in that situation, God. So we pray for those situations right now. We, we pray for those who are sick, that you would make them well, that you would care for them, that you would uh, be present in their lives, and that they would know your presence as they walk through this, God. You would give them confidence and help them to feel better, God, and that they would know you through this experience even greater, and that you would be glorified in whatever happens. Uh, we pray that you give uh, wisdom, to the medical professionals who are trying to help people, people who are suffering from this pandemic, God, but uh, in other ways as well. We ask that you help them all. God, we pray for those who mourn and grieve, that they would know your joy, that they would know your purpose, and that they would have that spirit of perseverance from you, and that they would experience your presence as they walk through this time. Uh, God, oh, we, we pray that in ways that, that they are suffering and struggling, that you would heal them there. God, we, we pray for uh, our nation, a nation divided in so many ways, right down to how we should be responding to this pandemic. We ask that you bring us peace. Help us to be peaceful people. Help us to be patient people. And we ask that, that you help our, our leaders right now, our government leaders from the President of the United States down to our senators and congressmen and women, our, our governors and our state representatives and senators, right down to our local council members and supervisors. God, give them wisdom to govern during this time, that they would make decisions that are good for the people in times of uncertainty. Uh, help them have the information they need to make wise decisions, God. And Father, help them to make godly decisions. Help them to bring about your good purposes as you promise us. God, when, when there are those in leadership positions who are not turned toward you, we pray that you use them in spite of that to bring about your good purposes. God, we pray for East Brady and the surrounding communities, uh, that we would be a people of faith. God, there are so many people who are out there hurting. Uh, we pray that you meet their needs, uh, whether they're financial or spiritual or mental or emotional or, or physical, God. We pray that you reveal yourself to them in mighty ways, that those who follow you would give you all the glory and those who don't would see you and they would know you by your presence in their lives and they would come to worship you through your son, Jesus Christ, unto eternal life, God. Bless your churches. Bless East Brady Baptist Church. May we be your joyful people who take delight in you and take delight in spreading the word of your good news of Jesus Christ. Father, may those words be ever on our tongues so that people can hear and know and believe because you tell us how are they going to believe unless someone tells them. So God, make us those instruments. Make us joyful servants for you. Show us how to love others. Show us who needs to be loved and then move us by your Holy Spirit. Equip us to do that loving God. As always, we pray it for your glory and your glory alone in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Well, we come to our time of teaching today, and I'm going to read to you today from Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, starting at verse 1. Maybe you've got a Bible handy that you could turn to and follow along. If not, certainly we are going to put the words of these scriptures up on the screen for you today as you watch. But Romans chapter 13, at verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone that you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. And may the Lord add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his holy word. Well, in a December editorial, Christianity Today, the magazine started by Billy Graham, called for Donald Trump to be removed from the office of President of the United States over questions of character. While some leaders in the evangelical church supported the editorial, others lambasted it, indicating that the editors of the magazine couldn't possibly be living by Christian values any longer. Likewise, last summer, David Platt, pastor of a D.C. area church and author of a book, uh, books that we have studied here, Radical and Cross-Cultural, well, David Platt brought President Trump onto the stage during a church service to pray for him. This after Platt had received a call last minute indicating, hey, the president's on his way and is asking for this prayer. So what do you do? He just brought the president in and prayed for him. Well, this action sent a ripple of tension through Platt's own congregation and actually through all American Christianity as Platt is a church leader on a national stage. He's known nationally. Some were uh, praising him, saying, kudos on loving our president, David Platt. Others were saying, David Platt, how dare you pray for such a man or back a particular political party during a worship service? It seems in the American church, we can't agree at all on how we should be treating the president of our nation. But lest you think it just stops with the office of the president or, or just that political party that the president is part of, consider this. When I woke up Tuesday morning, I was greeted by a Newsweek article reporting that some in Pennsylvania were claiming that Tom Wolf, the Democrat governor of our state, should be seen as the next Adolf Hitler because of the way he has handled the coronavirus pandemic. And I'm certain that, that as I saw this article posted on Facebook, many who saw it and liked it were then going on their Facebook pages and posting those fun little things that say, hey, share this if you're not ashamed to tell everyone that Jesus is your Lord. So sure, I follow Jesus and Tom Wolf is the next Adolf Hitler. See, the attitudes seem to be contradictory, revealing a double-mindedness that seems to have struck many American Christians. And it's a double-mindedness that's not at all in keeping with the Word of God. You see, so often we Christians in America, we, we pick our favorite government leader or our favorite politician or our favorite political party, and we just overlook every shortcoming that person has so that we can then look to the leaders and the politicians on the other side, and we can just pick apart every single little tiny thing they do. We point at the people in the government we disagree with and we say, how dare you? When all along, so many of us American Christians should be looking in the mirror and saying, how dare you? Because as failed as some of our government leaders may be, and they are, most of us are failing too. And the attitudes and the rhetoric we adopt toward our government leaders and sometimes glory in is some of our biggest failures. So... I ask you, are you ready for this sermon today? It's a little bit of a departure to the type of thing we usually talk about. 
But now that I have your hackles up, let me assure you that I'm not here today to tell you who you should support or who you should vote for, or which political party you should back, or, or really what stance you should take on any given political issue. Not today. I'm here today to remind us all to just check our attitudes as we make these decisions and act on them. Because I got to tell you, God is not silent on this topic, but we do a good job sometimes of ignoring him on it which ultimately has a negative impact on the kingdom of God. And specifically, it has a negative impact on our own personal witness for our Lord Jesus. We can't claim to give our lives to Jesus as our Lord, as our master, as our boss, and then ignore some of what he says. So we can't ignore him on what he says regarding our attitude in our treatment of our governing authorities. And he does say things about this in his word. Though it's not exclusive, often the go-to scripture regarding the Christian's relationship to governing authorities is Romans chapter 13, the passage I read to you at the beginning of this teaching time. Now, the first two verses do a good job of giving us an overall impression of what we are told in this passage. So let's put them up there and read them again. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, Whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Now, it's just two verses, but there's a lot to unpack here. And in fact, Christian thinkers over the years, the likes of Martin Luther and John Calvin and Thomas Aquinas, to name a few, they've written books and books and books and books regarding what these verses and a few other verses in the New Testament mean for the church and our interaction with government. I know because I had to read lots of them, or at least excerpts from lots of them, for my political science course way back when I was in college. Right, good news, we're not going to dig that deep into the weeds today. We're not going to cover books and books and books worth of stuff. But even as we give a cursory overview, there's lots of stuff to uncover here. Uh, and the first thing I, I want to uncover and really talk about today from this passage is this idea of where exactly does government come from? I mean, let's have a little bit of a civics lesson or a refresher course for some of you, shall we? In the United States, many of us know the phrase coined by Abraham Lincoln during the Gettysburg Address that indicates our government is of the people, by the people, and for the people. In America, it is said the people hold the collective authority of the government, and the people establish it. This is indicated also in the preamble to our United States Constitution, which reads, We, the people of the United States, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. It says, We, the people. In the United States in particular, the people are very much involved in establishing our system of government. But notice that even in these statements, uh, our founding fathers did not claim that the authority in government comes from the people. The people collectively hold the authority and use it to establish a system of government, the Constitution in this case, but that the authority and the function of the government themselves do not come from the people. They just hold it. That's because perhaps our founding fathers recognize what the Apostle Paul writes in our passage from Romans 13 today. When he writes to govern, about a governing authorities, he writes, There is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. That's from Romans chapter 13, the second part of verse 1. We see here Paul telling us that ultimately it is God who gives us government. God establishes government and its authority to govern. You know, if government has any authority, it's because God gives it to the government. Whatever system of government we happen to find ourselves under, the person of faith recognizes that the authority inherent in that system is ordained and given by God. So in the United States, we recognize that God establishes the authority of government among the people. And the people have come together to establish the system of who will wield that God-given power. We do that through democratic election. But ultimately, the power, the authority, comes from and through God himself. 
Now, Paul goes on in verse 4 and 5 to tell us why God does this. He says in verse 4 that God establishes authority within those who govern so that they can do good for those who do good, meaning if you're in a society and you're intent to keep doing good and, and keep things peaceful, the government's there to do good for you, to keep making it so that you can do that. But he also says in verse 4 that government officials can bring wrath. He uses the term bear the sword. They can punish. They can punish those who would do wrong or they would bring unfair or unjust disorder to society. That is the authority and the role given to those in governing leadership. God gives it to them. And it's actually a gift God gives to us by doing this as God recognizes that because of our own sin, we live in a fallen world. In a fallen world, disaster is going to strike. Some people are going to act up and some very bad things are going to happen that, that the people in general uh, can't control or, or stop. So God created an authority. He created government to maintain peace and order and justice. Reformed theologian R.C. Sproul, some of you might have heard of him, he, he put it like this. The great theologian Augustine said that government is a necessary evil, that it is necessary because of evil. And most theologians in the history of the church have said that human evil is the reason even corrupt government is better than no government at all. C.R.C. Sproul recognizes here that governments, they're not always good. They're not always good as God designed them to be. They're not always for the people as God established them to be. But they're sometimes evil. They're sometimes corrupt. And we'll look next week at what our response to be is to be as Christians when we encounter an unjust government. But in the meantime, today, we recognize that due to the amount of evil that is continuously happening in the world because of human sinfulness, even a corrupt government is better than no government. And God recognizes this. God recognizes that, that hey, people are going to take what he gives us for good. They're going to take government and they're going to corrupt it. But he recognizes also the need for an authority to maintain peace and order in this world. So he gives us government. And he gives leaders within our governments authority to carry out the purposes for which God established them. And that's why I think Paul, when he's writing these thoughts to believers in Rome, he sandwiches them between these two very similar statements. As we look again to verse 1, as Paul starts out the topic, he writes, everyone must submit himself to governing authorities. And then in verse 5, as he's kind of capping off his thoughts thus far, he writes again, therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities. It's there twice. Did you catch it? What, God, what Paul is commanding followers of Jesus to do? He repeats himself, right? He says, submit to your governing leaders. Now, the word for submit here means to subordinate, to put yourself under someone's authority. They don't have to make you submit. You do it yourself. It means to obey. You don't obey and complain. You don't obey and yet show disrespect. No, you subject yourself in obedience. It's what Paul's telling us to do. In verse 5, Paul says, hey, it's necessary to do this. It's necessary to submit yourself to governing authorities in this way. You need to do this. And in verse 1, he says, everyone must submit to governing authorities. Everyone. You know what everyone means? Everyone means everyone. So in our case, that means not just the people who voted for them submit to them, not just those who agree with their policies or stances on all or some of the issues. Everyone must submit themselves to the governing authority. That's what the Word of God says. You see, there's no magic out clause to fall back on here. Paul doesn't write, obey and respect governing authorities unless you don't like them, or unless you're a member of the other party, or unless you don't like the way they talk, or unless you don't like the way they treat their kids, or unless you don't like their attitude, or you don't like their favorite TV show, or you don't like the Easter candy that they like, or whatever. See, none of that's there. It's just submit to the authorities. Unless you think, uh-uh, Paul, you don't understand what it's like to live in, in, in this society and these authorities we have. There's no way I can submit to so-and-so, Paul. You don't understand. I want you to recognize that Paul is writing these things to people in the first century living in Rome. Rome. These are the people living at ground zero of the often cruel and wicked pagan Roman government. They are living on the doorstep of Caesar himself. Caesar, no friend to the early church, that's for sure. In fact, within a generation of Christ's resurrection, Caesar Nero had burned Christians on stakes in his garden. 
and he came up with all manner of other new atrocious ways to, to persecute followers of Christ in Rome. And these are the people to whom Paul writes, submit to the authorities. Paul's very aware. Sometimes governments aren't just and it's difficult, but he still writes this. You know, there's a joke attributed to Ronald Reagan as he was president in the 1980s during the last days of, of the Cold War. And, and to be honest, I don't know if President Reagan really wrote this joke or told this joke. Uh, but, but it goes, in the last days of the Cold War, there's an American and a Soviet, and they get into an argument about their governments. And the American says, in my country, I can walk into the Oval Office, pound the president's desk and say, President Reagan, I don't like the way you're running this country. And the Russian said, well, I can do that. The American said, you can. And the Russian answered back, yes, I can go into the Kremlin, to the general secretary's office, pound his desk and say, Mr. Gorbachev, I don't like the way President Reagan is running his country. See, the point is, we can disagree with our government authorities. We can, by virtue of the system of government we have in this country, seek to have a meaningful, productive interaction with our governing authorities when we disagree. But ultimately... Scripture tells us to submit, to respectfully obey our governing authorities. Look again at what Paul writes in verses 1 and 2. He writes, the authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. What this is saying is that when we fail to respectfully obey our government authorities, we are actually rebelling against something God has done. We're rebelling against God because God is the one who establishes those government authorities. People, rebelling against God doesn't ever turn out well. No matter what context it's in, just ask the people of Israel in the Old Testament. They rebelled against God in the desert, and so they ended up wandering around the desert for 40 years like nomads for 40 years with nowhere to call a permanent home. See, Paul warns us that by rebelling against God, by rebelling against the authorities he has put in place, we bring judgment on ourselves. It's a warning put there for us. As Paul's pleading for us, don't do this to yourselves. To once again quote theologian R.C. Sproul, the function of government is to restrain evil and to maintain, uphold, and protect the sanctity of life and of property. Given this function, the Christian understands that government is ordained of God, and so Christians, first of all, are called to respect whatever it is that God institute and ordains. Ladies and gentlemen, our government is ordained by God, and therefore we must respect it. What this means is that when we respect our governing authorities, our presidents and our governors, right on down to our local supervisors and council members, we are showing respect for God and what he has established on this earth. When we disrespect our governing officials, we are showing disrespect for God and what he has established. As we will discuss next Sunday, there are times when it is our duty uh, as a people of faith to oppose governing authorities. But those times are few. That much is proved by the fact that Paul writes this to Romans, people living in Rome. See, it's an unpopular truth that many of us, particularly in western Pennsylvania, don't like to hear. But it's truth from Scripture, and it's truth that God calls us to live by. So as we close our time of teaching, I want to ask you today, what is or what has been your attitude toward our governing authorities? Not only the ones you voted for and like, but also the ones you didn't vote for. You don't like them. I've got to be honest, I'm increasingly disturbed by the level of disrespect shown by Christians toward our governing authorities, both Republicans and Democrats. When you disagree... Do you do it respectfully and in a way that's going to foster helpful discourse for trying to come to an agreement or to change someone's mind? Or do you just throw out all the rules of civility so you can take to social media and any other platform you can get to accuse and insult our governing authorities who you happen to disagree with? Do you seek to sow discord against those in authority you disagree with? Or are you looking to obey even while respectfully trying to change things? See, there's a difference. It's all in our attitude. We don't have to agree with or even like everything they do. But God has spoken clearly on this matter. Submit 
to the governing authorities. And we've done a good job at ignoring God on this. And in doing so, as Paul writes, we will bring judgment on ourselves. So what, what time is it today in the United States, in western Pennsylvania, in the East Brady area? It's time to look at our attitudes on this. And if we knew to, it's time to change them. Let us pray. <sighs> Dear Father, oh God, we confess that when it comes to respecting and obeying the authorities and government who you have placed over us, God, we have just done a lousy job of obeying you. Uh, we have disobeyed you, and, and, and for this, God, we are sorry. God, help us. Help us, because this is a difficult thing sometimes to, to submit to someone, to people we disagree with or we don't like, or, or sometimes they're just not very just, God. And God, we know that there are times when, when we will need to, to oppose, but for the most part, God, those times are not upon us. And, and so we ask that you help us uh, to, to uh, respectfully submit to those authorities you have placed over us, God, and help us to be people of peace in that. And again, we ask that you give uh, our governing authorities wisdom to, to rule justly and in a godly way, God. But we, we ask that you help us to remain patient and calm. And God, when we disagree, help us to do that in a way where our voice is heard and that we can affect change, God, but in a way that is still respectful to those you have called into governing leadership. And we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, now is the time when, if we were meeting in person, we would turn our attention to the collection of your tithes and offerings. And during this time, we want to encourage you to continue in that spiritual discipline and in that act of worship through your giving. Because it does matter, I want to read to you uh, today a thank you note we received just last week in response to a, a monetary donation to a food drive in Brady's Bend that this congregation was able to make thanks to your continued financial support. It says, we wanted to thank you for your very generous donation towards the food drive. Because of the generosity of your church and others in the community, the event was a true success. We supplied food to over 100 families. Thank you. And thank you. You know, if you're a visitor who is not regularly associated with East Brady Baptist Church, we're not asking anything from you at this time. But for members uh, and for those committed to our congregation regularly, here's your opportunity to worship through giving. You, you can make checks uh, out to East Brady Baptist Church and send them to 508 Kelly's Way, East Brady, Pennsylvania, 16028. Now, to close out our time together today, we leave you with a piano solo again, a hymn of praise to the one true ruler and authority over all the earth, our Lord Jesus Christ. Crown him with many crowns. The words will be put up on screen, so please feel free to worship and sing along as we go through this. But until we meet again, whether in person or online, may the grace of Christ our Savior, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all always. Amen. God bless.